Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Salzberg, and coming up next, we'll be talking about hyperbaric oxygen therapy for our pets. So stay tuned to Pet Owners Hotline. Welcome to Pet Owners Hotline. I'm Dr. Mark Salzberg. We have a full slate of topics on this episode, including a guest from the Ravenwood Veterinary Clinic and a discussion on hyperbaric oxygen therapy for our pets. We also have some very special visitors to our show tonight. First, I want to introduce Dr. Melancic. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you, Dr. Dr. Melancic enjoys working with animals of all shapes and sizes and has a particular interest in orthopedic surgery, sports medicine, and complementary medicine, such as veterinary chiropractic and acupuncture. Acupuncture. Okay, well, again, welcome to the show. I want you to tell us a little bit about Ravenwood Animal Clinic and more specifically about you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, I am working at Ravenwood Veterinary Clinic. We are a six doctor practice um, and we are located in Port Orange, Florida. Um, we are actually open seven days a week and we see a variety of animals, anything from cats and dogs um, to any sort of wildlife, um, birds and uh, exotic animals or pocket pets uh, such as you know rabbits or guinea pigs, rats, really anything that has a heartbeat we'll see it in our clinic. Um, we have a, a wonderful big facility that um, has digital x-ray as well as uh, ultrasound. Um, we recently uh, got a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, which uh, we're proud to say we are one of three with veterinary hospitals in the state of Florida that now have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, um, as well as, uh, as a full array of surgical suites and tools, including laser therapy and, and therapeutic laser as well. Um, so we're very lucky to, to have all the facilities that we have available to us and, and ways to help our pets. Excellent. Now tell me a little about yourself. You told me a, a kind of an interesting thing that I thought you're, you didn't start off as being a veterinarian. You started off in... I actually was a human chiropractor before I went to veterinary school. Um, I realized that uh, as much as I loved helping people, I loved helping animals more. So I, when I finished and, and had done uh, practicing for a short while, I went back into veterinary school and, and I'm now practicing exclusively veterinary medicine. So that explains why you have these sort of, your interest in some of these alternative things, right? Yes, that's very, correct. Very cool. Now, tell me a little bit about um, uh, sort of hyperbaric oxygen. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is something that's used in the human medical field and, and more recently in the veterinary medical field as well. Essentially what it is, is it's basically um, a chamber where we put the animals and we essentially increase the pressure in the chamber and increase the percentage of oxygen in the chamber. And so what it, um, what it does for the animal is it helps to push oxygen to areas in the body that wouldn't normally be getting a good flow of oxygen, um, whether because the tissue is damaged or whether it's an area of the body that doesn't have good blood flow. Some of the main things that we use hyperbaric therapy for um, and that we've had success in our clinic with is uh, non-healing skin wounds, um, burns or bite wounds um, or just big open wounds that are having a hard time forming a good you know, granulation tissue. Um, we also see success in treating pancreatitis cases uh, where it's difficult to get that uh, oxygen into the pancreas and help them heal a little faster, as well as um, disc disease and, and dogs or cats with neurological dysfunction. Um, so those are really the, the primary areas that we use it um, and, and probably the, the most common is, is again, the, those skin, uh, skin non-healing skin wounds that we're seeing that uh, can be difficult to treat. Now, you, tell me about this. Do you, can you do this to pretty much any animal? 
just about any animal. What we um, what we usually have done so far is just dogs and cats. Um, you know, we do have some concerns with putting birds in the chamber since we don't know with their airflow um, how the the high pressure is going to alter them, and so we generally avoid putting you know any birds in the chamber. Um, but certainly any other small mammal mammal or dogs and cats can go right in. They don't need any sedation or anesthesia. Um, it's very calm procedure. Most of them, in fact, will fall asleep. Um, it's very quiet while they're in there because we've got it all sealed up. And um, the entire time that they're in the chamber, we do have a technician that sits and watches them, both on the video monitors as well as the windows uh, that we can see in and, and ensure that they're comfortable and doing just fine. The, the therapy generally lasts about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, it does take 15 minutes to get up to pressure and then to bring them back down from pressure. Because just like when you're scuba diving, you don't want to alter your, your body's pre pressure too quickly. Um, and the remaining time, of course, being the treatment at the desired pressure and, and oxygen levels. Okay. Um, what, before we go any further, I want to talk, ask some more questions about that. But I'd like to invite the viewers at home to join us in the discussion by calling us with your questions at 1-800-901-9238. And just a remind, excuse me, my, my director just reminded me that uh, we forgot to, to put a shout out to PAC, oh, excuse me, I think Troop 74 that came and visited, visited us here on the set last week. And so we want to say hello and thanks a lot for coming. I don't know if it's Troop or PAC, but it looked like Den. I don't know. It looked like Cub Scouts to me, but anyway, thanks for coming. <laughs> so back to the hyperbaric. Now, tell me, uh, what sorts of pressures do you get in there? Well, we can actually go up to about two atmospheres of pressure. That's generally about the level that we try to achieve. Um, sometimes when we're looking at, you know, the first treatment or two treatments, we'll start them a little bit lower. So meaning, you know, one and a half atmospheres or maybe 1.75 atmospheres just to gauge the pet's comfort level. Um, most of the time they do just fine and we don't have to worry or have any concerns. But just as a safety precaution, we generally do ease them up to that higher level of pressure. So are there any issues with, with them equalizing like we have? Not in the same sense that if we were, you know, coming and going on a, on a, from a scuba dive. Um, but, you know, you do have to be careful because there is changes in the inner ear with the different pressures. And so if there is any trauma to the inner ear or infection or already established um, damage, we, those would be contraindications to using this particular device. And under pressure, the animals have breathe fine. No, have, they, you know, like you said, they don't get panicky because of the pressure increase? Nope, they do just fine. Again, another one of the, the, re the, way, the reasons we would not put an animal in a chamber is if they've had any, you know, contusion or damage to their lungs, um, especially if they've got a collapsed lung or something that's altering the pressure within their thoracic cavity. So those would be good reasons not to put them in the chamber. So I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Three other clinics, or you're one of three clinics that's in correct. the state of Florida. Why? Well, you know, I think first of all, it has to be obviously a, a busy enough practice that um, this particular device is going to get utilized appropriately um, and enough to warrant having it in the clinic. Um, University of Florida is another facility that has uh, this particular device as well as um, a clinic in South Florida. Um, and so, you know, you have to have the facility set up to be capable to manage um, those types of pressures and oxygen um, and as well to be treating disease processes that that are um, advanced enough that really require this particular therapy. So this isn't for every little scratch or nick or post-op or anything like that. This well, is for a unique... It, it is, is definitely for unique, but it, it also does, you know, there has been, been evidence showing that it does improve skin healing. And so certainly if a pet owner wants absolutely the best care and just, you know, no holds bar care, even something like post-spay or po post-fracture repair or anything like that, putting them in the chamber is an excellent modality. Um, and, and certainly we do have people occasionally that, that would like that uh, added on to their routine surgeries as well. Um, we're going to go to the phones for a second, but, sure. uh, but just let me ask one more question before I forget because I will. Um, you say that the sessions are an hour and to an hour and a half. Yes. How frequent? We generally do them once to twice a day um, for a minimum of three days before we decide how we want to progress with their therapy. Sometimes we can extend that longer and other times we decide after the three days of treatment that we're happy with the results that we've gotten and, and stop there. Okay, cool. Um, we're going to go ahead to the phones. Uh, go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Hello. Hey, what's your question tonight? 
Yes. Um, our cat, um, he, he, he bites us. He bites at your feet. He okay. bites at and, your feet. Uh, yeah, and when some even when somebody comes to visit, sometimes he'll bite at their feet. Okay. Is this uh, a young or cat or an old cat? He's eight years old. Eight years old? And has he done this since you got him or is it something recent? No, it's something new. Okay. Has there any, been any other changes in your household, any new um, children in the environment, or um, have you moved recently or had any visitors come to stay? It, she's done. She's gone. Oh. So you're going to have to assume that. Okay. But those would be good questions to ask somebody if those are things. Very quickly, what might be some of the causes for those sorts okay. of behavior? So, you know, as the, some of the questions I was asking, you know, certainly changes in the environment um, of the pet can cause some of those alterations, you know, up to their behavior. Um, any sort of stress, whether we think it's a negative stress or a positive stress in their environment, can alter the way that your pet behaves on a day-to-day -day basis. And certainly, biting at your feet sounds like an attention grabbing behavior and so um, you know you may want to first rule out any medical causes and by getting a good thorough examination and, and potentially uh, you know a good evaluation of his teeth and oral cavity um, before assuming that it's a behavioral cause but any changes to the environment um, you know new people new pets um, you know even something as, as simple as having a, a relative come and stay for a period of time can warrant the, the pet wanting to get your attention in different ways. Good point. Um, we're going to stay. We have another caller. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Okay. What's your question? Hi. Um, I have a Bichon Frise. She's 10 months old, and she has all of a sudden taken to eating um, fabric and shredding up her blankets and all her toys. I can't even buy her a, a toy, and in five minutes she's got it all ripped apart, and she's taken to eating carpet, and just I don't know why. It's just all of a sudden. I just wanted to know if you, if you could help me with that. Well, we, we can certainly we can we can we can approach that. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, definitely as, as puppies grow and develop into their, their personalities as they get older, um, they can have different behavioral changes that come and go. And um, puppies are notorious for starting to chew up and, and shred different toys or, or things that they perceive as toys that may not be toys in your environment. Um, you know, obviously that can present a health risk to your dog as well, um, ingesting things like carpet and, and fabric and even fluff from toys um, can be very dangerous for for them and could result in, in, in surgery, which could even be life-threatening. So, um, you know, certainly avoidance is one of the biggest things you can do right now. Uh, making sure that your pet doesn't have access to these type of things when you're not there watching. Because if they do happen to ingest some of these materials, like I said, it can be um, very, very hazardous for their health and could result in not only a, a, a life-threatening um, procedures which need to be done, but um, also expensive procedures as well. Um, so avoidance is one of the biggest things you can do at this point, and whether that be by removing some of the toys or rugs or um, fabrics in the environment that, that she's getting at, um, or, you know, creating her when you're not there to monitor that. And uh, just a point that might, I, I, and I'm not sure because we'd need more, a lot more questions answered, but one of the things you have to worry about, especially with a, a dog that has developed this behavior that didn't have it before, she's long since passed losing her teeth, so it's really not a teething issue. But, <coughs> excuse me, um, one of the things that also can sometimes stimulate is that it's not uncommon for young dogs to develop separation anxiety. And some dogs will act out if, you're, if they perceive that you're away, um, whether you're in the next room, outside, or something, if, they did, if they're denied access to you. So sometimes they'll start doing things, ripping, shredding, stuff like that. And it may be, it may be that you, she's developed some of that. So it's something you probably ought to investigate. Certainly I would talk to your veterinarian, and, and they have a lot more questions to answer. But that's one of the things that might explain it. Mm -hmm. So... I want you to introduce so we can meet these special guests yeah. that we talked about. So absolutely. Well, I'd like to introduce Jenny Curtis, and she is with a nonprofit organization called the Wildlife Tree. And um, Jenny will talk a little bit about what this organization does. Yeah. Um, so at Wildlife Tree, what we do is we take in rescued exotic animals, and we use them to teach kids, uh, mostly schools and libraries, you know, scouts, things like that, about animals, nature, and you know where animals live and their environment and how they can, what they can do to conserve their environment a little bit. 
So I did bring some of our animal ambassadors today that I will be bringing out, and um, we'll, we'll go, go from ahead. there. Let's see what happens. So, so uh, t tell us a little about, I know you said that you talk about wildlife, but and then these are obviously not wildlife, at least not native wildlife. Yeah, what, well, what we do is we, we take in rescues, like I said. So some of them are domestic, some of them are exotics. Um, a lot of the domestics we get, we, we will rehome, find them a good home. <laughs> Um, but a lot of the exotics we get, they really shouldn't be pets in the first place. Right. The ones we brought today are, are okay as pets. They're not horrible. Right. But they're not, they're not for everyone. Right. So tell everybody who this is. So the first one there, that's Walter. He is a ferret. And Walter came to us from the Humane Society. Um, he was a pet, and the, his owner actually went to jail. That's how he ended up at the Humane Society. Okay. And then Dr. Malensic here is holding Buckles. He is one of our ball pythons. And Buckles came to us uh, actually from the state. They get animals surrendered all the time um, that people decide they don't want as pets anymore. Right. And they surrender them to the state, and then the state has this influx of exotic animals that they need to place. And we are one of the companies that they will call to place oh, those. Well, that's kind of nice. Yeah. And, and this is a good example, and we certainly will have some, some snakes that will visit us later in this, uh, on this show and some other shows. Um, but this happens to be one of the smaller of the pythons. Yes. And you know that, that uh, you know, all the problems that they're having with the larger of the pythons down in South Florida. Um, and so many of these animals actually are now not allowed to be told, not balls, but, but the other larger pythons are not allowed. But a lot of times you'd say people get these animals because they think, oh, you know, especially because the kids say, Mom, I want a ferret. I really want a ferret. I promise mm -hmm. I'll take care. I promise, I promise, I promise. And then they get them and find out that, you know, it's not that yeah. much fun, and mom and dad really don't want the snake or the ferret, or. And then lastly, here we have Hero the hedgehog. Uh, he's an African pygmy hedgehog. He was a previous pet that someone didn't want anymore. Um, you know, the best advice I can give people when they're looking to get a pet is do your research. Make sure you know the ins and out of owning that pet, how long it lives. You know, when your kid goes to college, who's going to take care of the pet? That's how we get a lot of the animals that we have. Um, so it, it really just means do your research and make sure you're able to provide a home for that right. pet for its life. And if you have questions, you could certainly call Jenny, I'm sure, yeah. and she would be happy to answer it. Or your own veterinarian will often answer and tell you about these animals. Mm -hmm. most, most veterinarians, even if they don't work specifically on exotics, they know enough about it. Um, I know you have a website. They, uh, there it is, wild, what is it? Wildlifetree.com. Wildlifetree.com. And how long have you been doing this? Uh, we started here in Florida in 2011, so oh. we're fairly new as well. And how many of these animals do you have to take care of all the time? Um, we have anywhere between 35 and 45 animals at a time. And um, you do try and find homes for the we ones? We do try and find homes for some of them, so depending on what it is, if we can use it in programs, we'll generally keep it. Um, if, you know, if it's a rabbit or a guinea pig that we get calls all the time about, we'll try and find homes for them. Oh, cool. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. We, I guess we can go okay. ahead and put these guys away. And this ferret, tell us a little bit about ferrets. I know we, we've had some shows about ferrets before. Um, we're, a lot of people think that they're cool, and they are cool animals, but they do smell. Uh, yes. That's typical. They do, even the ones that are neutered, do have, still have a continued uh, smell. So you might want to go and, ha if you th thought you may like to have a ferret, you may want to go and, uh, and actually uh, s hold one and see what they smell like before you get one home. Yeah, uh, they they are. are great pets. They are funny as heck to watch, and they, they provide hours and hours of entertainment. But they do have some special, uh, special needs. So, Tell us a little about some of the alternative things that you do. Um, you, know, you talked about hyperbaric oxygen. That's one of the Definitely. things. Do you do cold laser and stuff like that? We do, yes. We do have a, a therapeutic laser or a cold laser. Um, and we use that frequently for helping, um, again, to help with skin wound healing, um, sometimes just prophylactically after routine procedures. Um, other times when you have an animal who has, you know, we call it a lick granuloma, of course you know, but for our, our viewers, and basically Basically, you know, what can happen is the animal continues to lick at an area and it has a difficult time healing. And so we generally use the laser to reduce pain and inflammation in that area and promote healing. Um, we also use it for intervertebral disc disease um, as well as, you know, infected wounds or things of that nature. 
Um, so we do also use the therapeutic laser very frequently. Um, and in addition, as I mentioned, I'm a human chiropractor and um, have also taken a course in veterinary chiropractic. So I know how to apply the human principles to animals. Um, the big things behind the, the, the chiropractic <coughs> side being, um, again, to reduce pain and increase mobility uh, by making specific adjustments in the animal's spine or limbs. So what do you, what's, so you, sorts of things you use for us like osteoarthritis. Yes, absolutely. Um, osteoarthritis is one of the biggest things and intervertebral disc disease that is not causing paralysis, obviously. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go back to the phones. Okay. Go ahead, caller, you're on the air. Uh, yes, I was wondering if that hedgehog that they, they showed that was, uh, was turned in is uh, adoptable and what's the fee to adopt it? The hedgehog? Okay. Um, well, Jenny? Um, the hedgehog is not for adoption. We do, temp we do sometimes get hedgehogs in, but this is one of our permanent uh, animals that goes and teaches kids about animals. So. Uh, I mean, I will tell you that we, we've had, uh, we always have the Humane Society come do, usually they do the first show, and uh, the Humane Society sometimes will get hedgehogs as well as a, a variety of other exotic animals that come in there. Again, because people didn't do their homework in most cases, or, you know, or Sally or Susie wanted this animal and mom couldn't resist, and so she bought the animal, and Sally or Susie realized, and I, I should have thrown a, a Sam in there too. Um, just, you know, I'm, I'm, I have other things to do. I don't want to be bothered. So now all of a sudden there's an animal that doesn't have a caretaker. So, um, but you can do that. Or you certainly, if you really, really wanted a hedgehog, and that's probably something you ought to talk to somebody who has had a hedgehog. They're kind of interesting, but um, they're not warm and fuzzy and cuddly. You know, you can't hold them up and snuggle with them and kiss them. They're neat to watch, kind of like fish, you know. Uh, but not real, um, real handleable. Anyway, but that's another one. We're going to go back to the call. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Hello, caller. Hello. Hi. How are you? I have a two-year-old bearded dragon. Uh huh. And she got mites. We had. Crushed walnut shells as her aquarium sediment, and we already got rid of the shells, but we wanted to make sure all of the mites are gone. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, one of the, the, the best things that you can do with your BRD is um, certainly have um, him or her evaluated by a veterinarian to ensure that the mites are indeed gone. And, um, and of course, you know, we can make suggestions at that point uh, based on what the current environment of your aquarium is, some of the things that you can improve to kind of help prevent, um, you know, your beardy from having problems in the future. And, and that goes for, you know, mites or other parasites as well as, um, you know, malnutrition or even burns or, um, you know, problems with, with their with their scales and, and, and the way that they are able to maintain their hydration. So, um, so you know, definitely an, an evaluation by a veterinarian is definitely very important to ensure that the mites are gone, as well as to get some suggestions on, on how to prevent them again in the future. Um, good answer. Uh, we're going to go. I think we have time for maybe one more phone call. Uh, go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Hi. Um, I have a two-year-old Lakeland Terrier, which is a miniature Airedale, as you know. Okay. She's a very, very picky eater. And I mix um, dry food with a little bit of canned wet food, and she won't eat it. So I'll put a little bit of chicken in there. She loves chicken. But she'll only eat half, and then she'll beg for a treat. She'll sit there and bark for a treat. She knows where I keep them. And all she wants is treats. She doesn't want to eat her dog food. I, I need some help. It's driving me crazy. Okay. All right. All right. Well, you know, it, it is it is hard, and we find owners often go down this path because um, you do get a picky eater that then will will start to have a preference for a certain type of food or a treat. And the pickier the eater, the more creative the owner tries to get in, in getting the animal to eat. Um, unfortunately, what that ends up happening what ends up happening is the owners end up feeding mostly treats or mostly human food to try to compensate for the fact that the animal's picky and eating their dog food. 
Um, especially with some of the terrier, terrier or small breed dogs, we have to be very aware that um, they're prone to things like pancreatitis um, from eating high fat foods. And so we need to be very careful that we keep them on a good diet and that we don't get them on these high fat or high calorie treats or foods. Um, you know, even minimally risky is the fact that he, he or she may start becoming uh, overweight because of all the treats that they're getting instead of eating a good dog food. Um, so, you know, some of the things that you can try is, is certainly getting a variety of different dog foods and, um, and being a little bit more strict with the treats. I mean, with a cat, we have to be much more concerned with them not eating, especially if they go a day or two, a cat not eating, is, it can be a big, um, a big disaster. A dog um, will very rarely starve themselves. And so, you know, first you're getting a good examination um, and some blood work to make sure there's no underlying medical reason why your pet doesn't want to eat or is being picky. That's the best first step. Um, and then trying a variety of different dog foods and, and really kind of having that, that resilience of holding tight. We're going to have to cut you yeah. off here because yeah. we're just about out of time. And again, just a real quick thing. Remember, dogs train us very quickly. Yes. And if we get trained very quickly, then they get trained very quickly too. But we're out of time. If you were not able to get your questions answered, please email us at WDSC at DaytonaState.edu. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Melancic. Thank you very much for thank coming. You. And you, Jenny, thank you very much for coming as well. And um, thanks for introducing us to Hero Walter and Buckles. And I hope that you enjoyed the show and you'll join us next week on for another episode of Pet Owners Hotline.